All right, so in this uh, video, we're going to look at chapter 22, which is the respiratory system. And if you all remember, the respiratory system is essentially, you know, the system where you can participate gas exchange and airflow. It has a variety of functions, right? So you want to absorb atmospheric oxygen. You also want to eliminate carbon dioxide from your bloodstream. Uh, but the respiratory system is also involved with vocalization, like speaking, right? So um, if we look at a kind of a summary of the respiratory system here, this, look at, this is talking about the process of respiration. So respiration refers to the combination of airflow and the absorption of gases by your bloodstream, right? Um, so what we look at here then, you guys, is some terms we want to define. Like we first want to define what ventilation is. So ventilation, as you might assume, like with vents, you think of vents as being involved with airflow. So the process of ventilation in the body is airflow throughout the lungs, right, or your respiratory tract. So when we talk about pulmonary ventilation, that's just airflow. So in and out, right? Just moving air in and out of the lungs. Now, this pulmonary ventilation is going to be aided by the process of muscle contraction. So the muscles of like your respiratory diaphragm, your intercostal muscles, intersternocleidomastoid, they all participate in the you know, pulmonary ventilation. Now, this is going to be coupled <coughs> with a process called external respiration. So respiration is different than ventilation. Because here, we're talking about the absorption of gases across the membrane, right? So if you're talking about external respiration, we're saying that oxygen is moving from the air in your lungs into the bloodstream, and carbon dioxide is moving from your bloodstream into the air in your lungs. So external respiration is just gas exchange, but this is not airflow, right? Airflow is you're actually moving bulk amount of atmospheric you know, air all throughout the, your respiratory tract. External respiration is just gases moving across the membrane. So we'll look at the structure of this respiration membrane later today, but just kind of keep this in mind. So um, that's part of the respiratory system, right? You have a conducting region, which is involved with ventilation, and you have a respiratory region, which is involved with gas exchange. But then that has to be coupled with blood flow, because why would you ever want to just move air in and out of your lungs unless you had blood to do something with that, right? So that what you find is that the circulatory system is very intimately linked with the respiratory system because you need blood to flow to the lungs to be able to absorb that oxygen and you need blood to flow to the lungs to help, you know, sort of deliver carbon dioxide into the air in your lungs, right, to get rid of that CO2. So you find, you guys, that your respiratory and circulatory systems are intimately linked. So for transport of gases in the blood, you know, we have proteins um, like hemoglobin that can transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. And some of these gases also just dissolve within water, just sort of naturally through their solubility. And so uh, transport just refers to, you know, blood solubility and how it can, blood can move gases around your body. And then we also have internal respiration, right? So if remember, external respiration was moving gases between air and blood. Internal respiration is moving gases between blood and your body tissues, right? So if you're talking about internal respiration, that's everywhere where tissues are exchanging gases with blood. Whether your tissues are absorbing oxygen from blood or your tissues are delivering carbon dioxide into blood, that's gonna be internal respiration. So all these things are coupled and linked. And we'll kind of see this in better detail today. So if you guys look at this picture here, this is showing a summary of the respiratory system. So you can see we start up here with the nasal cavity. And we got our concha, so superior, middle, inferior nasal concha. And remember, we had the external nares and the, uh, the internal nares, and that led to the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. And then here's our larynx, which was the voice box, which we talked about in lab, but we'll go over in more detail today. And then air would flow down the trachea, or windpipe here, and then you reach this split called the carina, and it can go either into the right lung or the left lung by the way of the primary bronchi. So each primary bronchus or main bronchus serves a particular lung. Now, what's also kind of important to note here, you guys, is that the right lung is larger than the left. And the reason being is that, that your heart kind of is shifted to the left side of your thoracic cage, which means there's less space on the left. So your left lung is a little smaller than the right. And there's three lobes on the right lung. So you have superior, middle, and inferior lobes. And the lungs are kind of a spongy type of tissue. In fact, like, if you can ever feel a lung, if you guys ever get a chance that, to do that, you, you'll notice that it kind of feels like a tempur mattress, you know, like you can kind of squeeze it and it's going to retract sort of back to a resting shape if that makes sense and it goes the opposite way too like if you stretch the lung it will also sort of recoil back to a resting shape because of its internal elasticity okay 
Now, if you think about this, then, well, what keeps the lungs inflated if they have a natural tendency to kind of retract and uh, kind of shrivel up within themselves, right, because of their own elasticity? Well, and it, what keeps the lungs inflated here, you guys, is actually your pleura. So you guys have learned about pleura already back in AMP1, because we said this was the serous membrane that surrounds your lungs. And on this picture here, this is the pleura right here that surrounds the lungs. It's a serous membrane that adheres the lung to the inner thoracic wall. And so that way your lungs actually held to the wall of your thoracic cage and it keeps your lung inflated. If the pleura are damaged, then you can get collapse of the lung, which we call atelectasis. So keep that in mind. We'll come back to the structure of pleura here in a, in a minute as well. So in terms of functional anatomy, we want to differentiate between the respiratory and the conducting zones. So if you guys remember, the respiratory zone is essentially where gas exchange occurs. So this is going to be the places in your lungs where the, where the membrane is thin enough and you have blood vessels right there where the gases can just move across that membrane via diffusion, right? So you have to have a really thin membrane for gases to move via diffusion. Now the conducting zone is basically just a conduit for gas flow, right? So you're just talking about how the conducting zone really just helps move that air. So if you think about, well, where is the conducting zone? Well, it's going to be like your upper respiratory tract, which would be everything that's above your larynx that's involved with, you know, ventilation. And then <coughs> also pretty large portions of the lower respiratory tract, which is your larynx, down, okay? In fact, you actually don't even get to the respiratory zone until you start getting to, like, the microscopic structures of your lungs. You know, by the time you get to, like, the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli, these are microscopically small, and you, you know, obviously need a microscope to see these very well. And so, uh, but that's not why they are involved with gas exchange. What allows for the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli to move gases between air and blood is that they have very thin membranes, right? And so that way gases can just move across via diffusion really easily. But if you had a really thick wall, right, like a thick epithelium or like thick tissue, you know, it's, it's harder for gases to move through. So that's why you don't get gas exchange in the conducting zone. It's just the tissues there are too thick. So the main function of the conducting zone is really just to help move that air, conduct the air, right, for ventilation or airflow. And so that would include like your nasal cavity, you know, your nasopharynx and your larynx, your trachea, all of your larger bronchi, like the, the primary, secondary, tertiary bronchi, and uh, most of your bronchial tree. So the purpose of this, you guys, is that it actually uh, cleanses air. And the reason for this is that, you know, the air you inhale has got a lot of dust particles in it. You know, you can always see, you see this, like if you see like a beam of light coming through the window and like you can see little dust particles in that beam of light. Well, you're inhaling that air, right? You go, you inhale it. But you don't want that, those dust particles to get deep into your lungs. So what happens is that as that air starts to go through the conducting zone, the mucus along the conducting zone kind of captures those particles. And that's how it's cleansing the air because it's sort of uh, capturing the particulate matter that you're inhaling, right? So that gets trapped in the mucus along your airways. Uh, it also warms the air. It makes sense because often you're exposed to atmospheric air that's much colder than your own body temperature. Like imagine if it's freezing outside. You don't, we don't want freezing cold air getting all the way down into your lungs where it can potentially freeze your lungs, right? So you want to warm that air and humidify it. So humidification also helps protect cells because if you uh, inhaled really dry air, that can also dehydrate the membranes, which could damage the cells. So those are some of the main functions of your conducting zone, right? Cleanse, warm, and humidify the air. So if we look at this picture here, you guys, uh, we see the nasal cavity. Remember, we have the external nares right here. And so let's say if you did inhale some air through your nose, and you went, you brought it in, okay? Well, what happens when the air gets to the nasal cavity is that it hits these concha. Remember we talked about these back in uh, lab? We said we had the superior, middle, and inferior nasal concha. And the function of these nasal concha was to actually create turbulence in the air that you're inhaling through your nose. So why would you want to make turbulence in that air? And by turbulence, I mean kind of like it's all just swirling around and mixing around a lot. What's the point of that? What do you guys think? <coughs> so you're moving the air, good. But why do you want to move the air? What's the whole significance of like if you inhale air through your nose, why do you want it to move around a lot inside your nasal cavity? To warm it up because by mixing it, you're warming it. Good. What else is it doing? 
cleansing it, right? So it's cleansing it because there's particulate matter getting stuck in your, in your nasal mu mucus, which is going to contribute to boogers, you know what I mean? It makes sense. Like, have you guys ever, like, been exposed to a lot of dirt? And, like, maybe you inhale a lot of dirt through your nose, and then, like, maybe, like, you know, you, like, look at a booger, and it's just full of dirt. I've had that before. It's, like, kind of concerning. Like, oh, dang, that's not a lot, a lot of dirt in my nose. <laughs> I don't remember what I was doing when I thought that happened. But <laughs> What's the third thing to you guys? So warm, cleanse, and humidify. Very good. So that way, it already begins in the nasal cavity, and that's aided by the fact that your concha helped create that turbulence. If this were a smooth surface, instead of being bumpy, it wouldn't mix around as well. It just would smoothly flow in, which means the center of that air could be cold, it could be dry, and it could be full of dust, which you don't want any of those three, three, those three things getting down into your lungs. Okay? So uh, back here, we have the nasopharynx. And you guys see this little opening here? Remember, that's the, that's the opening or ostium to the pharyngeotympanic tube, a.k.a. eustachian tube. That's what connects your middle ear um, to, your, to your nasal cavity, pretty much. That's how it equalizes pressure with your, with your middle ear. And then nearby, we have the pharyngeal tonsil. We'll come back to this when we talk about the lymphatic system later. But it has a, an immune function. Now, one, one thing that's really cool about the tonsil here, you guys, is that it's got something called tonsillar crypts. And the tonsillar crypts are like infoldings of the tonsillar tissue that physically trap debris that you inhale. Now, if the, if the tonsils have an immune function, what do you guys think is the point of physically trapping debris that you inhale? What, what's your immune system doing, pretty much? Yeah. It's helping to cleanse that air, and it's kind of like informing your immune system of a potential infection very early on. Because what if you inhaled like virus or inhaled you know, bacteria or something? And that up went up and through your nasal cavity, and they encounter that tonsil, which is right in the back of that nasal cavity. And it's full of immune cells that are monitoring the environment there because it's also trapping what you're inhaling. So almost immediately, your immune system's getting some information about, okay, you know, are you inhaling things that are going to cause disease? And if they do, then you actually get an immune response that's actually, you know, sort of initiated pretty quickly, which is pretty cool. So I think of these like little sentinels, like they're kind of monitoring what you're inhaling and making sure everything's good. Which is pretty awesome. So that's the, one of the functions of your tonsils. So um, down here we have the oropharynx, which we talked about already. There's another tonsil. We'll come back to that later. And then we have the laryngopharynx. And then here's our larynx, right? We talked about the larynx already in lab because we said, you know, it's your voice box. But if you remember, the epiglottis had a digestive function because it closes when you swallow because the larynx elevates, which actually closes off the opening to the larynx. That way the food goes down your esophagus rather than your, your trachea. So <laughs> we already talked about this path, right? If you go down the esophagus, we already talked about that pathway and where that goes and everything that happens along that path, right? Today's lecture is all going to be about, well, what happens when air goes down this path, right? Down the larynx, down the trachea, and then even deeper, okay? So if you notice that in the larynx, which is your voice box, uh, we also have the vocal cords, right, or vocal folds. So we have the true and the false ones. The true ones are the, are the vocal cords that are actually involved with producing sound, right? Uh, the false ones above them, they don't produce as much sound. Like they can if it's like a gurgling sound, but they mostly are involved with, uh, you know, helping to close off the opening there during Valsalva's maneuver because they're part of the glottis. So if you all remember, Valsalva's maneuver was, huh. and so your false vocal folds are closing right there. That way you can help prevent the escaping of air at that point. Okay? You guys see how it's all blue? The reason why this is blue is that this is hyaline cartilage, and so the structure of your larynx is supported by hyaline cartilage, not bone. You guys remember, like, what's the consistency of hyaline cartilage, like going back to a and 1? Like, is it harder than bone? Hyaline cartilage? No, definitely not. Um, but it's somewhat bendable, right, because it also makes up your ribs. So it needs to be able to stretch a little bit. So it's not as hard as bone, but it is somewhat flexible. And that kind of makes sense in terms of having a structure in your neck because by having a somewhat flexible but also solid structure, it can protect itself because it's solid. But it's also bendable because you want to be able to bend your neck around, right, and be able to move it around. So the larynx can kind of bend with that a little bit, okay? But it's not as strong as bone, which means you can damage your larynx if you get hit in the neck, okay? Okay. So uh, what we see here, you guys, is the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. What were some of the key uh, anatomical things in the nasopharynx we just talked about? So what do we got in here? What's this thing right here? 
good. It's the opening to the pharyngeotympanic tube. Nice. How about this one? Right behind it. Pharyngeal tonsil. Very good. Also called an adenoid. You guys have heard that before? So you got to get your adenoids removed. They're talking about that particular tonsil. Good. What are these little bumps? Y'all remember? The concha. What's the function of those concha? You're right. They'll tell you. So they, they humidify, cleanse, and um, uh, warm the air. But they do that by mixing, right? So they mix the air, and by mixing it, it allows those three things. Okay, good. Uh, fourth thing you can add there too, you guys, helps you smell better as well. Because if you're inhaling air that's full of odorant molecules, and your olfactory nerves are up here, if you mix that air, and it actually gets to the olfactory nerves better because the air is mixing, you're going to smell things better as well. So the concha aid in the process of olfaction or smell as well. Okay. So let's look at the structure of the larynx here, you guys. So remember the larynx, it's supported superiorly by your hyoid bone. This was like a floating bone here in the superior part of your neck, just beneath your chin or mandible. Um, now the hyoid bone is there for two, for two reasons. First of all, it forms the superior most part of the larynx. Secondly, there's a lot of swallowing muscles that actually attach to the hyoid bone. And that way when you swallow, it actually can pull on the hyoid, which actually pulls on the larynx. That way your epiglottis can close. Now, we didn't talk about those particular swallowing muscles going back to like the muscular chapter in AMP1, um, but just kind of keep that in mind. Now, the hyoid bone is also something that you can look for as, an, as evidence of asphyxiation, right? So like if, you, if you're doing autopsy or something like that, and you're, you're suspicious about some, whether someone was like choked, you know what I mean? What they look for is whether or not the hyoid is intact. Because usually, if it's a choking related death, it usually requires enough force to break the highway bone. That's what they're looking for there, which is kind of interesting. Okay. So um, right here, you guys, we have the rest of the larynx. This big old piece of cartilage here is the, called the thyroid cartilage, right? Makes sense because the thyroid's nearby. And then down here, we have the cricoid cartilage just below it. In between the two, we have that cricothyroid ligament. Remember that one? Now, this one's clinically relevant because this is where you can do a cric, right, a cric tube or a tracheostomy, so you can, you can actually put a little hole there, that way someone can breathe through that hole rather than their mouth because there might be an obstruction, whether it's like a tumor or they're choking, you know, you can do, you can put a little hole there. So this was actually important to put a hole in the cricothyroid ligament because for one, it's going to heal better than the cartilage because it's actually vascular. And two, it's inferior to the vocal cords. You guys remember this? The laryngeal prominence or Adam's apple that's the place where the vocal cords anchored anteriorly, right? And so if you did your tracheostomy here or made a hole right there, you're saying you're damaging the part of the larynx that the vocal cords actually anchor to, which means you might save their life, but they're going to have difficulty speaking after that, right? And so it's important to go lower than this uh, laryngeal prominence, right? Hopefully you guys never have to do that. Like hopefully you never have to cut a hole in someone's neck, you know, in an emergency situation, but at least you would know where to go. Right? Not the Adam's apple, right? Because the vocal cords are there. A little lower, you want to find that, that cricothyroid ligament. Okay. Um, so if you look at a, at a, at a mid sagittal view of, of the larynx, here you guys, remember here's the epiglottis, we already talked about that. And then here's our vocal cords. So we have the vestibular one, which is the false vocal cord. And we have the vocal fold or true vocal cord below it, right? So which ones are, are the ones that actually produce noise or sound? Well, true. That is true. Good. Uh, what do the false do? What's their function? They close the larynx during falsalvas. So what happens is when the when these vestibular folds or false vocal cords, when they contract and kind of shorten, they close off that opening, and that way air doesn't escape. And that's called valsalva's maneuver, and you would do that during straining. You know, like your book talks about things like if you're lifting weights, like you don't want just air to escape. Right? Uh, so if you're like power lifting, you'll whoop, right? Let me get that weight going. Hey, there we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, or if you're defecating, urinating, you know, during labor, all Valsalva's maneuvers associated with those three those things. Okay. So inferior to the larynx, we have the trachea. And you guys see the trachea is also supported by cartilage. Now these cartilaginous rings are not complete. So we call them as C rings because they don't form a perfect circle. They actually have uh, incomplete ends that don't connect. So it looks more like a C. And um, if you can look at the larynx from sort of a superior view looking down, 
what you find <coughs> is uh, here's the uh, base of the tongue, there's the epiglottis, and then here's the true vocal cords. You guys see that? They actually even kind of look like reeds, like reeds on a clarinet. If y'all ever seen that before, and they even function kind of like a reed, because when that when those the, when these things vibrate, they vibrate against each other. That produces tones, and you modify those tones with the rest of your mouth, like your tongue and your lips, and that's what you're going to use to produce words. So the tone that you're producing uh, begins the larynx, but the sort of the other sort of finer nuances of words you're producing with your mouth, with the action of your lips and your tongue, okay? So uh, that's the true one. And then next to it, you see the vestibular folds or false vocal cords. And these together form the glottis, right? So all of these true and false vocal cords form the glottis together. And so if they're open, what can we assume go is going on right here, guys? Like if the vocal cords are open at this point, and there's a space between them, what can you assume about what's happening. There's maybe sound being produced, good. And so in order for sound to be produced, what needs to be occurring with that? Think air, right? So if they're open, what's happening with the air? Moving, right, exactly. You see them open, air is probably moving. But not necessarily, and we'll talk about why that is, but in a little bit. So, uh, and so you can do this using like, a, like what's called a laryngoscope which is basically a little device, it's like a tube. They can go down someone's throat, all right, go down their pharynx, and then go down the larynx, just past the epiglottis, and you can just basically observe what their vocal cords are doing. And you can do this to determine if someone has like maybe a cyst on their vocal cords. Like uh, I think uh, Adele had a cyst on one of her vocal cords. She had to get removed. That's partly why she went on hiatus there for a little while. Um, and then, uh, or if someone, if someone has difficulty speaking, it could be a vocal cord dysfunction. So. A laryngoscope can highlight that. I'll show you guys a video of this here in a second. Okay, so what about the larynx, you guys? Well, we said the vocal folds act as a sphincter to prevent air passage. So we have Valsalva's maneuver. Can you guys, can you guys tell me what Valsalva's maneuver does or show me? <laughs> right, exactly, good. That's Valsalva's, okay? And I always wonder, I always worry, like, I, hopefully I don't do it too hard, right? <laughs> because if, if Valsalva's maneuver is involved with urinating and defecating, one of my phobias would be like, all right, guys, if Valsalva's maneuver is, huh, oh, no. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> you gotta be careful. So how does that help with urinating or defecating? Well, when you do Valsalva's maneuver, you're contracting the abdominal muscles. So abdominal wall muscles contract, and so that would normally help to force air out of the lungs. But if you close off the opening for air to leave, then what you're doing is you're preventing the air from escaping. So all you're doing now is causing pressure to rise in your abdominal cavity. And that's going to do a couple things. I mean, it's going to force urine out because urine is going to move from the bladder to an area of lower pressure, which would be like outside of your body. It's also going to help force feces out because the feces is going to move from an area of lower, I'm sorry, higher pressure to low pressure, so like from the rectum out of your body. And it even helps during labor, same thing, okay? So it helps <coughs> during heavy lifting as well. And that kind of makes sense because, you know, you don't want your core to like relax and you want to maintain like adequate pressure. That way, if you're doing like heavy lifting, you know you can maintain some structure there as well, and you want to hold on your air so you don't lose it all every time you try to lift something. Okay, cool. So let's look at the structure of the larynx. I'm sorry, the trachea. Here, you guys, remember the trachea is the windpipe just below the larynx. And so, the, if, remember how we talked about the, the trachea is also supported by cartilages. So this kind of horseshoe-shaped cartilage in the wall of the trachea, that's the tracheal cartilage, and it's also made of hyaline cartilage. So it's tough but also somewhat flexible. And you see that it does not form a complete circle. And so we call this actually a C ring. So the C rings of your tracheal cartilages are called that because they're kind of C shaped. In fact, their ends don't touch, but their ends are connected by a muscle called trachealis. Now this trachealis muscle that connects the ends of the tracheal cartilage, that's smooth muscle, so it's under involuntary control. And what do you guys think would happen to the lumen of the trachea, like this space in here? What would happen to this space if the trachealis muscle contracted? Like if this muscle shortened, what would happen to the lumen? It would get smaller, exactly. And we would call that, you know, uh, uh, constriction. So that the, the lumen would get smaller. And do you think you'd have more or less airflow if, if it's constricted? Definitely less. It's, I mean, it's a smaller tube at that point, right? So, con so contraction of trachealis 
can lead to constriction of the lumen, which reduces airflow. When would you maybe want to reduce airflow? During fight or flight? Would you want to have less airflow? No. So when would you want to have less airflow? Then? Rest and digest. You got it. Good. So what do you guys think happens to tracheal's muscle during the fight or flight response? It relaxes. You got it. In fact, that's where the beta-2 receptors are, beta-2 adrenergic receptors. And when epinephrine and norepinephrine bind to those beta-2 adrenergic receptors, tracheal's muscle actually relaxes in response to adrenaline or epinephrine, right? And when it relaxes, what happens to the lumen? Gets wider or dilates. And if that lumen gets wider, what happens to airflow? Increases. And that makes sense, right? Because if you're fight in the fight or flight response, you want even greater airflow, okay? So it's kind of cool. And we'll talk more about the smooth muscle along your respiratory tract as we go. And then if you guys look inside of the lumen, uh, we have an epithelium that lines that space, which is part of the mucosa. And the epithelium here is a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, right? So it's pseudostratified because it looks like there's multiple layers, but there's not. They're column-shaped cells, and they're ciliated. So what do you guys think is the function of the cilia here in the, the mucosa of your trachea? Why have some cilia there? Or actually, what do, what do cilia do? Do you guys remember? As a, as a cellular extension? Good. Okay, so that's very good. So particles get captured by the mucosa in the mucus, right? And then, then what? Because the, cili the cilia are, are just kind of stuck in the mucus. But what are the cilia going to do with that dirty mucus at that point? They move it, right? Because remember, cilia are the extensions of cells that move. They kind of wave around, right? They kind of have this little wave-like thing. I think about this like the wave. Actually, not the wave. Uh, I think about the cilia of your respiratory tract kind of like a concert where if someone does crowd surfing, you know, where some, like you get pushed up, which is the weirdest thing, I think, you know, but you get pushed up on the top of a crowd and like they're like moving you around. Imagine all the arms of the crowd are like the cilia and the person that's riding on that surface is like the debris that you just inhaled, right? So the cilia form what's called the musociliary ladder. And that way, if you do get larger particles that are inhaled, into your trachea and even deeper structures, the cilia actually help wave that mucus with the trapped particles up and out of your airway where you're probably going to swallow that mucus down your digestive tract, okay? Um, unless you got like one of those old-timey spittoons, just like spitting into a spittoon all day. <laughs> By the way, I was actually at a museum recently in, uh, at the a medical campus in Aurora, and uh, they have a, they've got a whole museum of like old signage and that kind of stuff. And apparently, when tuberculosis was just, like, spreading all throughout Denver, you know, back in the day, uh, they were telling people, like, don't spit. Because apparently people were, like, spitting, like, the chewing tobacco out in the street and stuff. But the problem with that is that if they had tuberculosis, that sputum, they're, like, spitting on the street, you know, it could potentially spread to other people. So there, but there's, so back in the day in Denver, they had signs everywhere, like, saying, don't spit, right? Like, don't spit. And so it's kind of interesting how things have changed. Because <laughs> I see people spit in the light rail all the time. Like, what are you doing? Actually, I yelled at people once. <laughs> it was kind of funny, actually. Uh, all right, maybe I was just kind of dumb on this one. Maybe I, I could have got stabbed, but I was okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, right here, you guys, you see some mucus glands. So these mucus glands actually secrete mucus, right, into, into the lumen. And so it's the mucus that traps the debris, but it's the cilia that move it. So if we look at this in cross-section here, this is the epithelium. So it's that pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Here's the cilia, you see those little, those like finger-like projections along the uh, apical surface of these cells. Here's our lumen. And then uh, deep to that, we have submucosa. And in the submucosa here, we have mucus glands, which basically secrete mucus through ducts onto the surface. And then deep to that, we have cartilage or hyaline cartilage. So uh, I think I forgot to mention the function of hyaline cartilage in the trachea. So if we go back here, you guys, and we think about, okay, well, we have these tracheal cartilages that support the airway. The reason why they're there is that when you're breathing, sometimes there's a vacuum inside of your trachea. So when you inhale, you're actually creating a vacuum, which is negative pressure inside your airway. And if you didn't support that airway, it would collapse in on itself. So you have to have hyaline cartilage there to keep that airway open. Otherwise, if it were just like loose tissue, and when you went to go breathe in, it would, it would actually close in on itself, and then we would get no airflow, right? So keep that in mind. Okay, so... Um, you can see these cilia better here, you guys, in this electron micrograph image. And this is 2,500 times 
right? Like our microscopes in lab are what, like 400x? This is pretty zoomed in. You're obviously not gonna get the pictures like this in, in lab here, but it's still kind of cool to see like the shaggy hair or cilia on the surface here. And their main function is basically just to wave that dirty mucus out. Now what's kind of insidious about things like smoke, you guys, like cigarette smoke, is that there's chemicals in the cigarette smoke that inhibit ciliary function. And so what you're saying is not only are you just inhaling tar and debris, but that tar and debris also damages the cilia such that they can't remove that tar and debris. So it kind of compounds on the issue. You're inhaling something that prevents your body from removing it, right? So that's why people get like black lungs, right? Which we call anthracosis. And it's just sort of an accumulation of tar in your lungs from smoking or just being exposed to smoke. Okay, so if we look at the uh, respiratory tree, you can see this kind of well here. And if, let's imagine if we flip this upside down, right? Where this is like the trunk of the tree and you got some branches. In fact, we would call this the bronchial tree because it even looks like a tree, right? So the main trunk of that tree is the trachea. And the first, pla the first place it branches is called the corinna, right? Um, do you guys remember the clinical significance of the corinna back in lab? I think we talked about this. Why well, got to be careful about this corinna? Of nerve endings, right? So there's tons of nerve endings here in the corinna, such that if they get tickled by like debris that you inhale, or maybe like if you had like a, you know, you have to go on a ventilation tube, and the ventilation tube goes too far and they hit that corinna, um, essentially what that can lead to is like coughing and gagging, that kind of stuff. So it leads to coughing reflex. So it's a very sensitive part of your airway. That's why you gotta be careful of that. <coughs> so if you're coughing a lot, like me, apparently then your corinna might be, you know, uh, being irritated. So over here, you guys, um, on the screen over here, you can see the right main bronchus and left main bronchus. Which one looks bigger? What do you guys think? And it's kind of hard to tell from this picture, but let's just think about the size of the lungs. Which one should be bigger? The right, exactly. Good. In fact, you guys see that the right main bronchus is not only wider, but it's also kind of steeper. Like if you inhale debris, it's more likely to go down straight into the right lung because the left lung its left main bronchus is more narrow and less steep. So clinically what you find is if someone aspirates a foreign object, like a Cheerio or a marble or like glitter or something, <laughs> you know, it's more likely to go down into the right lung than the left. So that's kind of interesting. Same with cigarette smoke, by the way, you guys. The particulate matter in cigarette smoke is more likely to go in your right lung than your left lung. So when you find like smoking-related lung cancers, they're mostly right lung oriented. I'm not saying you can't, you can't get, you know, smoking related lung cancer in the left lung, it's just more likely to occur in the right because the right main bronchus is wider and steeper. So particulate matter is more likely to go into that particular lung, right? So if you guys look beyond that, if this is the primary or main bronchus, the next time it branches, right here, that's called the secondary, aka lobar bronchus, right? So it's called secondary because it's the second split from the trachea, and it's called lobar because it actually serves the entire lobe here. Like the superior lobe of the right lung is served by this particular lobar bronchus, okay? Just like this particular secondary bronchus here uh, serves the entire middle lobe, and this particular secondary bronchus serves the entire inferior lobe. So it's kind of interesting. How about on this, you guys, this side, you guys? Which, which, which uh, structure is this one? Is this a main or secondary bronchus? Main bronchus, also called primary. How about when it branches, like, let's say, up here? Secondary, a.k.a. lobar, because it goes to the entire lobe here. How about when it branches down here? Is that secondary or tertiary? This is also secondary, because this is the primary still, and it splits here to form one secondary, and here to form another secondary, and this one goes all the way down to the inferior lobe of your right lung. I'm sorry, your left lung. Just kidding. So how many lobes are in the left lung? Only two, right? That differs from the right lung, because the right lung has a middle lobe. There is no middle lobe on the left lung. And so what makes the left lung smaller? You guys remember? Yeah, the heart. <clears throat> so if the heart were shown in this picture, you see that the heart's kind of shifted slightly to the left, and the, the biggest part of the heart is also protruding to the left, which means that there's not a lot of room in the left side of your thoracic cage, so the left lung is just naturally smaller. So what if we went even deeper, though? Well, what you'd find are these microscopic structures here. And so by the time you get to this picture, what it's showing here, guys, 
is we're actually looking at things that are almost or pretty much microscopically small. And <clears throat> the terminal bronchial here is about 27 splits or so later, right? So if the trachea splits into the primary bronchus, and that splits into secondary bronchi, and those split into tertiary bronchi, imagine now we have 24 additional branches. So they branch 24 more times. And so uh, by the time you get to these terminal bronchioles. Now if you guys remember, the terminal bronchial is the beginning of the respiratory zone, right? Everything else that's proximal to that is all part of the conducting zone. So if it's the respiratory zone, what's happening at this level here? Gas exchange, very good. What if it's the conducting zone, you guys? What's happening there? Is there any gas exchange occurring there in the conducting zone? No. So what's the main function of the conducting zone? Just airflow. So let's go back here, you guys. This only shows the conducting zone, not the respiratory zone. Because we look here, we have our trachea, then it splits. These are all just still too big. And it goes down, 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 down. And you can't even see the microscopically small structures here, which means I know there's a lot of branches here, you guys, but all of those are still just part of the conducting zone. You can't even see the respiratory zones in this picture. Unless we look at another picture that kind of highlights what these would look like. Now, these are pretty small. Uh, you're going to need a microscope to image them pretty well. And so terminal bronchioles are where that begin. Then it goes into respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli. So this, from here, all the way to here, is part of the respiratory zone. So this is where gas exchange occurs. However, where most of the gas exchange occurs is in the alveoli, which are these little grape-like clusters there. So do you guys remember going back to uh, earlier in the, in the lecture here? What was so special about the respiratory zone that allowed for gas exchange to occur here, but not like, you know, in the trachea or larger bronchi? Like, why, do, why can gases, or how can gases move across uh, these membranes? They're thinner. You got it. So these are thinner, and guess what? There's lots of circles. Think going back to, we talked about circles before. What? You got it. More surface area. Nice. Because remember how we said the whole point of bile in the digestive system was to emulsify fats into lots of smaller circles because that increases their surface area? So what you find, you guys, is by having like all these millions of little alveoli, there's more surface area in your lungs than if your lungs were just like one big Ziploc baggie-like structure that just kind of like would inflate and collapse, infl inflate and collapse. By having lots of tiny, tiny little sacs, which we call alveoli, there's way more surface area in your lungs, like a lot, right? We're saying it's like about half the size of a tennis court in your lungs, you know, in terms of surface area. So there's a lot. Uh, okay. So the point of that is you want good gas exchange there. Okay. So do you guys look here too? See those little, all these little gold lines that surround each alveolus? All those little gold ribbons, you might look to say, they look like, those are elastic fibers. So every alveolus is surrounded by elastic fibers, and their function is for the elastic recoil of your lungs. So when you go to inhale, and your lungs inflate, and when you relax, the lungs will natu naturally recoil back towards a resting shape, right? And that's aided by those elastic fibers that you find all throughout the lungs, okay? Now over here, we have some smooth muscle, and those are on the bronchioles. So what do you guys think is the function of the smooth muscle of all, all your bronchi and bronchioles? Think of trachealis. What was, what was the smooth muscle function for that? Allows for more or less airflow. Very good, right? So if they relax, you get more airflow. And if they contract, and it causes your bronchioles to constrict, you get less airflow. Very good. And so that comes in, into play when you start thinking of things like anaphylaxis, right? Where like uh, you can start responding to things you're allergic to severely, such that your airways start to kind of close up and it's difficult to breathe. You get like kind of wheezing, that kind of thing. So um, in a little bit, not in this video, but when, you know, later we'll talk about different drugs that can aid with the process of ventilation by causing airway relaxation, okay? So let's zoom in on those alveoli some more, though. So if you guys look here, these al by the way, alveolus means grape-like cluster. So it kind of makes sense, because these kind of look like big old clusters of grapes, right? So what you find here is that your terminal bronchial leads into a respiratory bronchial, which leads into the alveolar duct, kind of down here, and that leads into alveoli. So all these circles are alveoli, 
And if you guys look here too, not only are there elastic fibers that surround each alveolus, but every single alveolus is also surrounded by capillary beds. So capillaries are the smallest blood vessels of your body, and they also have thin walls. So if you have a capillary bed, which has a thin wall, next to an alveolus, which has a thin wall, those together form what's called the respiratory membrane. And that's where gas exchange occurs, is between the, the capillary walls and the walls of your alveoli. Now you're separating blood from air because there's still cells between the two, but that membrane is like less than a micrometer thick. It's something like, like 600 nanometers thick, which is point, like 60% of a micrometer, and an average cell is 10 micrometers thick. So these things are super, super thick. Okay. <clears throat> so if you zoom in on these alveoli, this is kind of what they would look like, right? So you're taking a cross section of a sphere, and that's why it kind of looks like a circle here. And you guys see that there's simple squamous epithelial cells that line the inside of this alveolus. Those are the type 1 cells. Their sole function is to participate in gas exchange because they're very thin. The type 2 cells are kind of shown as green here. These ones produce a, a glycoprotein called surfactant. Okay, And so pulmonary surfactant, its main function is to reduce the surface tension of the water in the mucus in your alveoli. So I'll give you guys an example. Maybe you guys have noticed at some point in your life that water is kind of sticky, right? Because if, let's say if you take a shower, the water sticks to your body, right? It actually clings to you. That's why you have to towel off. If the water weren't sticky, it would just, just zoom right off your body. You would never need to towel off. Right? Okay, so that's one example. Another example of where you notice water is sticky is like, let's say if you have a cup on a table and there's some condensation near that cup. You guys ever notice that where you gotta try to like lift that cup up and it kind of sticks to the table a little bit? Okay, so it has some stickiness to it. The stickiness of water is because of the hydrogen bonds that can occur between water molecules. They're a weak bond, but because you get lots of hydrogen bonds between many water molecules, as a whole, the hydrogen bonding in water contributes to things like surface tension, which is pretty strong. In fact, surface tension on water is so strong that you like little bugs can walk on water. You can float a paper clip on water. You know, it's also so strong that this is how people die from jumping off bridges. You know what I mean? Like you've heard of this before. So you, know, you think, okay, well, how, why would jumping off a bridge be bad for your body? Well, because if you're, if you're falling from a high height, you have to hit that water and break the surface tension of the water to get down in there, right? But that's so much force that it ends up like, you know, causing damage to your neck and that kind of stuff. So knowing that water is sticky, how is this important in alveoli? Sorry, I got a little dark there. <laughs> that was a little dark example. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so knowing that water is sticky, how is this important in alveoli? Okay, well, you wouldn't want the walls of your alveoli to collapse and stick together, right? Like a cup on table. So what you need then is a molecule that breaks the surface tension of water. That way it keeps the alveoli open or patent. And that molecule is respiratory surfactant. Now respiratory surfactant is made by these type 2 alveolar cells and, or pulmonary surfactant, right? And so it breaks the surface tension of the water in your alveoli, which basically keeps your, lung, your uh, alveoli open or patent. What do you guys think would happen if you didn't have enough pulmonary surfactant. What would happen to your alveoli? They'd collapse, right. Now, not, not just one, all of them. Now, if these alveoli are collapsed and sticky, imagine trying to inhale. What's going to happen? You're going to breathe. What's going to happen to your lungs? It's going to stay kind of sticky, right? In fact, you're going to have to fight the internal stickiness of your alveoli to pop those open and get air to flow in. It's going to take a lot of extra force. And you see this with disorders like infant respiratory distress syndrome or IRDS. This is where like premature, preemies, like premature births, they're not ready to make pulmonary surfactant. Their lungs are still sticky, right? Their lungs are still developing. They're premature birth. And so they actually have a lot of trouble breathing at that point. There's things we can do for them, but, you know, they still have respiratory distress. Okay? They can, this can also happen in adults, but uh, it's typically <clears throat> avoidable because the type 2 cells make surfactant. And by the way, you guys have all encountered surfactant probably just today already because an example of surfactant is soap. So soap breaks the surface tension of water. That's one of the ways that soap helps clean things, right? 
And so if you guys ever notice this, where maybe like if you if you pour some soap on uh, water that has little oil droplets in it, you know the water the oil droplets can like just kind of spread apart, right? Well, it's because it's breaking the surface tension, and the oil doesn't like to sit on that anywhere anymore. They kind of just kind of spread really quickly. Um, also, if you if you were floating a paper clip on water, and you drop some soap in that water, the paper clip would sink, right? Because it, it, the, it breaks the surface tension of that water. Same thing with water striders. If you guys want to even be kind of messed up, you know, you go find those little water bugs you crawl on water. If you, if you sprinkle some soap nearby them, they will just sink to the water. They can't run in the water anymore, right? You broke the surface tension. <laughs> so, uh, third type of cell you guys find in alveoli, macrophages, which you can see here, right? So, alveolar macrophages are immune cells that basically help to remove any debris that maybe made it down there, right? I know we talked about how the mucosa of your nose and your conducting zones kind of cleanse the air, but it's still possible for particulate matter to get deep into your lungs. And at that point, at least you still have some macrophages to help remove that debris. So it's kind of good. Now, if you look at the respiratory membrane, you can zoom in on this little spot right here, right? So here's this air-filled space or alveolus. There's a blood vessel. And to be zoomed in right on the association of the type 1 cell and your blood vessel, it would look like this over here, right? So here's air, here's blood, this is the type 1 cell, and this is the endothelial cell of the blood capillary. In fact, here's our red blood cells. This thickness here, you guys, is like 600 nanometers. I mean, that's like that's on, on the wavelength of light. Like light has that kind of wavelength, right? That's how thin this is. Now, it's thin enough to prevent, you know, a lot of water from leaking through. But it's also, I'm sorry, thick enough, you might say. But it's also thin enough for gases to move across really well. In fact, by having a thin membrane, the gases move more readily. If this membrane thickens, these gases don't move as well. Okay, so you got to keep that in mind. Like if you have inflammation within your lungs, or if there's like extra mucus in there, which thickens this membrane, both of those are going to limit proper gas flow, um, or not gas flow, but uh, gas diffusion into or out of your bloodstream. So if this is diffusion... What does that mean about concentration of these gases, you guys? Remember, diffusion is where gases or molecules move from high to low concentration, right? So if oxygen is moving this way, where do you find a lower concentration of oxygen in this example? In the blood. You got it. How about if carbon dioxide is moving this way, where do you find a lower concentration of carbon dioxide? In the air in your lungs. That's because you find way more CO2 in blood than our atmosphere. Like atmosphere carbon dioxide is less than 1% of all gas in the atmosphere. Okay, so if we look at the association between blood vessels in your lungs, you can see, first of all, there's a lot of blood vessels in your lungs, okay? So we're going to focus on pulmonary circulation here. But we're going to come back to pulmonary circulation when we get back to the cardiovascular system later, like when we talk about the heart. So one thing that's important to note when you look at these kinds of pictures, you guys, is that blue means deoxygenated, and red means oxygenated, okay? Now, if you want to define artery versus vein, technically an artery is a vessel that carries blood away from the heart, and technically a vein is a vessel that carries blood back to the heart, okay? So, if your heart is pumping blood to the lungs, is that an artery or a vein? If your heart's pumping blood to the lungs, away from the heart, is it an artery or a vein? What's the definition of an artery? A vessel that carries blood away from the heart. So if your heart is pumping blood to the lungs, away from the heart, is that an artery or a vein? It's an artery. Good. Now, do you guys think that the blood that's going to the lungs is oxygenated yet? No. That's the whole reason why you're pumping it to the lungs. So if you guys look at this blue thing here, that's deoxygenated. So is that the artery or the vein then? It's actually the artery, yeah, exactly. So how does that make sense? Well, your heart is pumping blood to the lungs because you're trying to oxygenate this blood in the lungs, right? And so that's, it's blue because it's deoxygenated, right? And then in the lungs, it becomes oxygenated. So that all the red things here are what? Arteries or veins? They're veins. So the red vessels here are carrying oxygenated blood back to the heart, right? And so it's a vein because it's carrying that blood back to the heart. 
So if the pulmonary artery is blue, the pulmonary vein is red. I mean, in real life, not really. But on these types of anatomy drawings, they show it like that. Because blue means deoxygenated, red means oxygenated. Okay? So keep that in mind. Don't forget that. I know it kind of goes against probably what you've learned in the past. Because if you took in like just like an intro to A&P class, maybe like in, I don't know, high school or middle school, usually they say, arteries are red and veins are blue. And they kind of like leave it at that, right? And you're like, damn it. That's not actually always true. <laughs> okay. So, by the way, what keeps the lungs inflated? Going back to our like previous... Uh, discussion like in the beginning the pleura nice you guys see the pleura here by the way yeah so here's the thoracic wall so you can see some bone you got some muscle there here's the pleura right so you have a this a parietal layer of pleura which is right up against the ribs and you have a visceral layer of pleura which is right up against the lungs and in between the two you have the pleural cavity which is full of serous fluid which is a lubricant right so not only is the, are the lungs adhered to the interthoracic wall, but the tissues that adhere those lungs to the interthoracic wall also lubricate the outside of the lungs. What do you guys think would happen if you didn't have as much fluid in this pleural cavity? Let's say if there's less fluid and the pleura could potentially rub up against each other. Friction. And that friction is going to lead to what? Pain and damage and inflammation. Right? And so you see that sometimes, like with pleuritis. Right? So people get inflammation in the pleura if they don't make enough pleural fluid. Um, all right, guys, cool. So the pleura here, we have two major layers, parietal and visceral. When you think of parietal, think of not on the organ, but rather lining the, the body cavity. So the parietal pleura is, on, is actually inside of the thoracic wall or cage. If you guys have ever like, cooked up ribs before, you probably remove this parietal pleura. They call it the skirt. Um, or maybe you know, maybe you've heard of it called the silver scan or something like that. But basically, it's like a really thin, kind of whitish-looking tissue that, like, if you're cooking up some, like, I don't know, some ribs, you know, you actually have to tear that away from the ribs because it's kind of chewy. And that sounds disgusting because we're talking about humans right now. But I mean, that's what I'm trying to like give you guys an example. Maybe we've seen it before, you know. <laughs> so that's parietal pleura, and it lines the inside of the thoracic cage. Okay. But if you follow that parietal pleura around, you'd notice, though, that when it gets to the lungs, it turns into a visceral pleura, right? Visceral is right on the lung surface itself. And the visceral pleura is adhered to the lungs. So if the visceral and parietal pleuras are adhered, and the visceral pleura is adhered to the lungs, and the parietal pleura is adhered to the thoracic cage, what you're saying is that your thoracic cage is effectively adhered to your lungs via the pleura. That way, whatever your thoracic cage is doing, your lungs are going to do it with it, right? So what's going to happen to your lungs if you expand your thoracic cage? They're going to expand too. Because as your thoracic cage expands, it pulls on the pleura, which then pull on the lung with it. So your lungs expand when your rib cage expands. What if we go the opposite way? What if your rib cage uh, starts to relax back to a resting shape and like kind of contracts? It's going to force down your lungs, and your lungs are also going to get smaller. Good. Okay. So pleural fluid is that lubrication fluid you find between the two layers. And you need enough of that stuff. However, there's not a lot of pleural fluid around each lungs, you guys. It's something like 5 to 15 mils, which is not a lot of fluid, right? So it's just a very thin layer there in the pleural cavity. So uh, I always, I always kind of think this, this picture is funny because this guy looks way too happy for having his chest cage removed. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I had a student from another class saying, like, maybe, and I, th I said, maybe he kind of looks, like, slightly annoyed. I can't really tell. <laughs> They're saying, well, maybe because he's only getting paid 100 bucks to model this. And I was like, damn, 100 bucks? That's a lot just to stand there and just be like, you know, I would do that for 100 bucks. Why not? <laughs> so um, here's your lung. Here's your thoracic cage. If you zoomed in on this association here, you find the pleural uh, membranes. So what's this pleural membrane that's right on the lung called? Visceral layer. How about on the ribs? Parietal layer. How about the, between the two? Pleural cavity full of serous fluid. Very good. So there's like a nice lubrication layer between those two. Awesome, you guys. So do you guys see the respiratory diaphragm is down here too? So the lungs and pleura are also adhered to this respiratory diaphragm. Now what's kind of weird is when the diaphragm contracts, it actually pulls downward. When it relaxes, it goes back up. I know you might think the opposite. So what does this mean if your diaphragm contracts? Well, it's actually going to pull on your lungs inferiorly. It's going to stretch your lungs down, 
when your diaphragm contracts. And so we'll come back to this here in a minute. So what we want to move on to next, you guys, is talking about the mechanics of breathing. So for breathing, we also call this ventilation. And ventilation was airflow, right? But to get air to flow, you have to have a difference in air pressure. So uh, air only moves from high pressure to low pressure. So if there's wind, like let's say out there, basically there's wind because the wind is air, it's gas, and it's moving from high pressure to low pressure. So you guys hear about like in the weather, they talk about, okay, well, like there's like a low pressure system moving into Denver or, you know, in your, into your city. What that means then is it's going to bring in air with it because if there's low pressure here, air is going to flow in. And if there's clouds in that air, it's going to bring in the clouds with it. That's why they say that low pressure systems bring in storms because it's going to pull clouds and air into that area of low pressure. Same thing in your lungs, you guys. If you have low pressure inside your lungs, air is going to flow in through your mouth. What if you had higher pressure in your lungs? Where's the air going to flow? Out. Good. And so when you start talking about the mechanics of breathing, it's all about the difference in pressure, right? Where is the pressure higher? Where is it lower? That's going to tell you where the air is going to flow. It always flows from high to low. So with inspiration and expiration, these are just the terms we use to describe the direction of airflow. So inspiration is like, oh, you're, you're breathing in, right? Like, oh, man, I'm inspired. <laughs> you go, oh, wow, that's cool, right? So you're breathing in, inspiring, right? And then expiration, you're going, oh, man, that food I bought expired. And they go, oh, dang it. It's past its expiration date. By the way, have you guys ever eaten food past its expiration date? I've done it too. Like, all right, I'm going to risk it. Like, it's like something that I really want to eat, and I'll smell it, but like, it's probably fine. You know what I mean? If it's something I really like, I'll eat it past the expiration date. But if it's like something I usually don't even like anyways, I'll just throw it away. It's kind of interesting. But do you know, you guys know the, those expiration dates on food labels? They're usually more conservative than when the food actually goes bad. Because it really just means that the, the, the uh, grocery store shouldn't sell it past that date. It's kind of more like a sell-by date. Uh, so it's usually good for longer after its expiration date. It's just that grocery stores don't want to get sued for selling rotten milk. So they kind of play it safe, you know what I mean? So they, they give you a date that's well before when it's actually going to go rotten. Uh, you can just smell it anyways. So expiration versus inspiration, you guys. What's, what's, what's bringing air in? Inspiration, good. And then what's, what's bringing air out? Oh, inspiration. Dang it. Inspiration. And you got to have both, right, for proper, for proper ventilation. Okay. So if we just discussed how air only moves from high to low pressure, what can you guys tell me about the pressure differences during inspiration? Like if gases are flowing into your lungs, where's the low pressure at? Inside your lungs. Good. How about during expiration? If gases only move from high to low pressure, where's the high pressure at? So where's the high pressure if you're expiring air? Gases move from, from high to low. Yeah, higher, they have higher pressure in your lungs during expiration, okay? So the reason why I use those two examples, you guys, is that breathing doesn't change atmospheric pressure around you. Obviously, like, your, your body and your existence isn't going to change, like, you know, all of the air that's around you. But what you can change are the pressures in your lungs. So what do you want to do to air pressure if you want to bring in air? Like, if you want to inhale, what do you want to do to your lungs? Lower the pressure, good. What if you want to exhale or have expiration? Raise the air pressure in your lungs. Good. And guess what, you guys? The way you do this is by changing the volume of your thoracic cage. Because by changing volume, you can change the pressure. And so um, if you look at this example here, uh, we talk about atmospheric pressure or the air pressure that's around you. It's 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 torr at sea level. But we're not at sea level, right? In Denver, we're at like a mile high, give or take. And so our air pressure is actually lower where we are because our atmospheric pressure is actually determined by the entire column of air that's above your head all the way up towards space, right? Now, since we're at a higher elevation, there's less air between us and space, which means the pressure is lower at our elevation, right? If you're at sea level, there's more air above you. In fact, there's exactly a mile more air above you, right, since we're at a mile high. So the difference between us and sea level, whole mile, and that whole mile of air 
that's above your head if you're at a sea level actually is even more pressure than when you're at Denver, right? So 760, though, is at sea level. So what do you guys think it might be around Denver? Is it a number greater or less than 760? Less. It's a smaller number. There's less pressure, right? It's measurably different. That's why people say, like, the air is thin here, because they're feeling the, the, the light pressure here. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. So, uh, but we don't want to use these big numbers because it gets kind of confusing, right? So we don't want to say, like, 760, 762, 758. You know what I mean? So to compare the pressures... We standardize atmospheric pressure at zero, okay? So atmospheric pressure or air pressure that's around you, we just call zero millimeters of mercury. So once you zero it out, you're just saying that that's atmospheric, right? It's not literally zero pressure because if that were, then you'd be in, in the, the vacuum of space, right? But, it, you know, because we live in an atmosphere, there's some pressure in there. Okay, so if we standardize air pressure at zero, and you look inside the lungs, and we say, oh, wait, there's zero in here. Is there a difference in pressure between atmosphere and inside the lungs at this point? No, they're both zero. So if there's no difference in pressure, is air flowing at that point? No, because what do you need for the air to flow? Pressure difference, right? A pressure difference, that's the important point. Not just any pressure, but a pressure difference. So what if the pressure inside your lungs was greater than atmospheric pressure? Where's that air going to flow? Out. Good. What if the pressure inside your lungs was less than atmospheric pressure? Air is going to flow in. Ice. Perfect. Very good. So if it's zero and zero, air is not flowing, right? You're just like your mouth's open. There's no air movement, right? And that can happen. So um, other pressures, though, we want to talk about. That's, by the way, that's called intrapulmonary pressure. So intrapulmonary means within the lungs. There's also an intrapleural pressure. Do you guys see how here it's also negative? If it's negative, we're saying the pressure is lower. If the pressure is lower, that's technically a vacuum. Because to have a vacuum means there's less pressure. So why might you want to have a vacuum inside your pleura? Can you guys think about what that be? Well, first of all, what's the function of pleura? To hold the lungs in place, right? Now, if there's a slight vacuum in pleural fluid as compared to your lungs, and your lungs are at zero, but your pleural fluid's at zero, what's your, what are your lungs going to try to do? They're going to try to go into that space and try to fill that space, right? Because your lungs are at a zero pressure and your intrapleural fluid's at a, at a negative four pressure. So this is high to low. So your lungs are going to kind of try to fill up that space. So that negative pressure inside your pleural cavity also uh, helps keep your lungs inflated. Okay, cool. So we call that intrapleural pressure. And the difference between uh, intrapulmonary and intrapleural, we call it transpulmonary. Okay, so... Let's talk about how air flows. And the first law we gotta talk about to describe this is called Boyle's Law, okay? Now, Boyle's Law is the relationship of volume to pressure, okay? So if you increase the volume of a container, its pressure goes down. If you decrease the volume of the container, its pressure goes up. And you guys know this, right? Because let's say if you have a little, a little Ziploc bag and you cinch off that Ziploc bag and you start squeezing that bag, what are you doing to the volume when you squeeze that bag? Are you increasing the volume or decreasing it? You're decreasing it, right? But what happens to the air inside that bag when you start squeezing it? The pressure, rather. The pressure goes up, right? In fact, you can squeeze it so hard it pops, okay? So um, let's think about this in terms of your thoracic cage. What do you guys think would happen to the pressure inside your lungs or intrapulmonary pressure if your thoracic cage got smaller? Like if your thoracic cage was kind of depressed, what happens to pressure inside? It goes up. Good. And so if pressure is higher in your lungs because your thoracic cage is depressed, where's the air going to flow then? Out. You got it. And that's what, that's what expiration is going to do. So expiration is increasing pressure in your lungs. That way air can flow out. Okay. What about inspiration or inhalation? Well, you want, you want to decrease pressure in your lungs. And the way you do that is if you increase thoracic volume, like check out my rib cage when I breathe. You go, you can see it's all kind of flared out, right? So when you breathe in, the ribs flare out, the diaphragm depresses, and the whole rib cage elevates because your sternocleidomastoid muscles contract. All of that increases thoracic volume. And when you increase thoracic volume, pressure decreases. So we say that they're inversely proportional. So when volume increases, pressure decreases. 
and when volume decreases, pressure increases. Okay, so keep that in mind. In mind, that's Boyle's law. Okay, let's check this out, you guys. So what this slide is showing are the processes of inspiration. So here's your rib cage, and the major inspiratory muscle is your diaphragm, your respiratory diaphragm here. It also includes your uh, external intercostals, which are between your ribs, as well as sternocleidomastoid, which you can't really see here, and scalenes, which you can't see here either. But the three of those muscles together, they increase the volume of your thoracic cage. So when you go to inhale, right, your thoracic cage volume increases. What happens to pressure inside your inside your lungs? Intrapleural, I'm sorry, intrapulmonary pressure will decrease as volume increases, right? They're opposite. So increase volume, decrease pressure. So if the pressure is lower inside your thoracic cage or intrapulmonary pressure, you might say, where is the air going to flow at that point? Now pressure is lower inside your thoracic cage, right? So if it's lower inside the lungs and higher in the atmosphere, air is going to flow in your lungs, right? Good. So let's check out the next slide here, you guys. Actually, it was funny is when I, when I made these PowerPoints years ago, I made sure to match up these slides perfectly. That way, <laughs> that way I can do this. You guys see what's going on here? This would be like you're hyperventilating. <gasps> oh my gosh. <sighs> okay, okay, cool. What's going on here? Well, volume increase. If volume increases, what happens to pressure inside? Decreases. How about this next slide? Whoop. Volume decreased here. And when volume decreases, what happens to pressure inside? It increases. Good. And so then what would happen next as the pressure starts to rise inside your thoracic cage? Air would flow out. Good. So my next question for you guys then is, let's say if you wanted to inhale, what would you want to do to your thoracic cage? Expand it. Good. Because by expanding your thoracic cage, you're decreasing intrapulmonary pressure and therefore allowing air to flow in to where there's lower pressure, right? What if you wanted to exhale? What would you want to do to your thoracic cage? Decrease volume, right? So if you decrease the volume of your thoracic cage, what does that do to pressure inside your, inside your lungs? Increases the pressure, so then air flows from high pressure to out, right? Good. Low pressure atmosphere. Awesome. All right, guys, cool. So if you just kind of wrap up on this slide here, what we're looking at are those volumes and pre pressures, okay? So let's look at intrapulmonary pressure. That's within your lungs. Intrapleural pressure is in the pleural cavity, and this is the volume of breath. So if this is the volume of breath, you guys, we have inspiration, expiration, right? Or so inhalation, exhalation. And you guys see it goes up to 500 milliliters. What volume was this? You guys remember? If it's only 500 milliliters. What's that? Oh, no, uh, not male, female. Just kind of like, remember the volumes and capacities we talked about in lab? What's, what's about the 500 milliliter volume we talked about for breathing? You guys remember that one? When we calculated vital capacity? What was the little one? The little tiny fluctuating one? Tidal volume. You got it. So this is tidal volume. So during tidal volume, which is normal quiet breathing, you inhale 500 milliliters of air and exhale 500 milliliters of air. So, seeing that, let's, let's ask ourselves, if air is flowing in, because the volume of your breath is, you know, increasing, what is the pressure in your lungs doing? Well, let's go up, right? So intrapulmonary pressure, oh wait, here it is. It's lower, right? That kind of makes sense. Because as intrapulmonary pressure decreases, air flows in during inhalation, okay? How about this one here, guys? This zero point. Let's say if intrapulmonary pressure is zero, is there a difference between the pressure in your lungs and atmosphere? No. So, do you have airflow at this point? No. In fact, let's go down here, guys. So, this zero point means no, no difference in pressure. If you get on here, the volume of your breath's not changing, which means air is not flowing. So, you might wonder, what does this look like? That would be like the peak of your breath, where you go, and after you've inhaled some, and the air stops flowing, because the pressures are now equal. Once the air flowed in, that brought in pressure with it, 
and so now there's no difference, and so then you don't get air flow at that point. Now, if you wanted to exhale that air now, what would you want to do to pressure inside your lungs? Increase it. So let's check this out, you guys. So you're exhaling the air. During this period of time, intrapulmonary pressure is rising. So what's causing your intrapulmonary pressure to rise during exhalation then? So what would get the pressure to increase in your, in your thoracic cage? The size of the thoracic cage, right? So what's it doing? So what's your thoracic cage doing to increase pressure? It's, it's sort of uh, contracting back to a resting shape, right? So volume of your thoracic cage is actually decreasing, which is causing your pressure to rise here, which is higher, and that's why you're exhaling that breath, okay? Now, this one here is the intrapleural pressure, and the reason why I've been avoiding that is that, you know, it doesn't really relate that closely to those two variables, but what's important to note, though, remember, intrapleural pressure is the pressure that's inside of the pleural cavity. So let's think about this. During inhalation, when your thoracic cage is expanding, and your thoracic cage is actually pulling on the pleura, it's pulling on that parietal layer of pleura, what's happening then is actually it's pulling those membranes apart. And as you pull those membranes apart, you're increasing the volume there in your pleural cavity, which means the pressure is decreasing there. Then your lungs start to kind of fill those in. So the thoracic cage expands, and it pulls the lungs kind of later with it. And that's why the pressure is actually getting lower here. And it stops getting lower because then the lungs catch up with the thoracic wall. Okay? But what about when you start to relax during exhalation? And the thoracic cage just goes back to a resting shape. Well, what's happening is now the ribs are forcing down on the pleura. And you're decreasing that pleural cavity size, right? Which is increasing pressure in the pleura. And so that's just some, and something to think about. Okay? So you guys have any questions from this? Okay, cool. Thank you. Stuff you guys later.